Now joining us from Washington, D.C., is journalist, filmmaker Patrick Gavin. He's covered Washington politics for over a decade, most recently as a reporter at Politico, but he quit his job there to make this newly released documentary, Nerd Prom, Inside Washington's Wildest Week. The film goes behind the scenes at the White House Correspondents Association's annual dinner, which, besides the inauguration every four years, is probably the closest thing to the Oscars for the nation's capital. For more information on this delightful event, go to nerdpromthemovie.com, and Patrick Gavin joins us from Washington. I have attended many of these. What led you to turn this into a documentary? Well, you know, I'd covered it for about a decade, but I'll be the first to admit I didn't cover it very well or ask any real probing questions. And, you know, towards the end of my time at Politico, I realized that I'd really obviously grown from a dinner into a weekend into a week, and it really had become the signature event for Washington, D.C. every year. And yet, not a lot of people, I think, outside of Washington know about it. They might, they might know about the jokes that the president tells, um, but they don't know that it's really evolved into our Super Bowl. And, and, and I kind of felt that there was a real story to be told there, and I thought that what Americans don't know about the week would probably disturb them. Now, how is it different, I've attended that many times, from the radio and TV correspondence dinner, which is usually a few weeks before, right? Right. And then there's also the gridiron dinner. I mean, the one thing that makes this stick out is the fact that the president does attend every single year. Uh, the last president to skip it was Ronald Reagan in 1981. He had a great excuse, however. He had just been shot. Uh, and every president really uh, has attended this dinner at one point or another. And so as a result, it's really earned a special status compared to the other ones, simply because uh, the president, you know, so far uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't ever skip it. Has it uh, changed much over the years? It sure has. I mean, obviously, celebrities have started to come a lot more. Uh, but I think really m more importantly, it's, it's, it's stopped becoming just about the dinner. It's now uh, about five days of parties and events, about two dozen of them when you, when you count them all up. It kind of shuts this city down. And, and really what it's turned into is not really something about White House correspondence, uh, but instead it's turned into kind of, kind of a big business opportunity, a good way for people to glom onto the dinner, to promote their brand, to promote their business, to influence people, to lobby people. So it's really become much more about just trying to support White House correspondence. But from the title, is your documentary a comedy? Uh, it certainly has comedic points, I'll point out. Uh, it, it certainly got some funny moments. I have to be honest, one thing uh, that one, uh, one bit of feedback that I've heard a lot from people who've watched it is that it is kind of depressing. And, uh, and, and I think they're right. I think that, you know, the question we try to ask in this film is that, you know, in a town like D.C. that's supposed to be about civic mindedness and about doing uh, the good work of others, is there any way to make our Super Bowl about something more meaningful than simply parties and business branding? Um, and yet, when you ask people around town uh, if they see you know, any opportunity to change it, most people in D.C. say the same thing. Yes, we know that this is kind of a joke. Yes, we know it's kind of ugly in a lot of ways. But so what? That's just the way things are in D.C. And to me, that was a very depressing uh, thing to yeah. realize that people in D.C. are so conditioned to it that it doesn't really necess necessarily even bother them anymore. And everybody gets the glad hand and rivals from different networks shake hands with each other and then go back to disliking each other the next day, right? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. I mean, there's a lot of that. Right. I mean, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, a lot of people ask why celebrities come. And uh, most White House correspondents, to be honest, don't like the celebrities. But the reason celebrities come is kind of, as you mentioned, there's a lot of uh, ad executives or heads of big media companies who like to say, oh, I got Scarlett Johansson at my table or I got Justin Bieber. And so it's that kind of one-upsmanship that actually has kind of turned the dinner into what it is now. Oh, I was a hit one year when I had Cato Kalin. Very nice. There oh, you go. That was a smash. The Clinton couldn't wait to meet him. Is that right? Let's show another clip from... Uh, this uh, his very important, hysterical, and important at the same time documentary, Nerd Prom Inside Washington's Wildest Week. Here's another clip. A political celebrity origin. Politicians party. Never seen anything like this in my life. The celebration of us. And so you're sitting there going, wow, this is crazy. Washington is so cool that even stars want to be part of it. Yeah, I meet the president all the time. I didn't notice I was too busy drinking. It really gets a little silly at times. Folks are going to kill themselves to get them a ticket to this dinner. Now, how do they pick the comedian who will uh, give the kind of keynote address? 
Well, usually that's at the decision of whoever the president of the association is every year. Uh, and what's kind of interesting, and we hit on this in the film, is that it's actually not always easy to fill that to fill that spot, despite you know how how prominent of a gig it is. A lot of comedians can turn it down because one, it's you know it's just a huge ballroom. It's hard to hear. Uh, the audience is pretty liquored up. Uh, they're really there to see the president. That they're not really there to see you. And on top of that, uh, jokes that might work for that comedian normally don't necessarily work in that room where senses of humor can be a little smaller, sensitivities can be a little bit higher. Uh, and you know, so sometimes comedians will actually skip it, or or if they don't skip it, they'll find that it's just a very difficult room because of all the various things you need to take in a, take who, into account. Who, in your estimation, was a big hit comic, and who bombed? Well, it's interesting. Uh, Stephen Colbert in, in 2006 kind of bombed inside the room, but went on to enormous acclaim outside the room. I think it was the most downloaded, you know, C-SPAN clip in history or or, or in iTunes history. Um, you know, but but inside the room, he got a lot of flack for some people said he was far too mean to President George Bush. Uh, I mean, recently it, it's been pretty good. Uh, you had Joe McHale this past year. He was good. Conan O'Brien was good. Jimmy Kimmel was good. The only person in my recollection um, who really bombed was Rich Little, I think, in 07. He was just not the right uh, comedian for the room and, and didn't, didn't get a lot of laughs. Do uh, the hosts get guidelines? Are they told anything like, don't say this? Well, there is this um, sort of tradition, I think it was actually inherited from the Gridiron Club, which is that you're supposed to singe but not burn. And what that means is, you know, you can make fun of politicians, you can make fun of the president, you can make fun of reporters, but don't carry it too far. In other words, don't make it nasty, uh, don't make it spiteful. Stephen Colbert, by some people's accounts, violated that rule. Other people thought it was uh, really quite good humor. Um, but as a result, the humor is good, but it's never the kind of thing where people are kind of walking away with their tail between their legs. It's all supposed to be, you know, all in good fun. What president was the funniest? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think that looking, I mean, certainly not Bush 41. Uh, Reagan always did quite well. Um, you know, recently, um, you know, Obama kind of has on years and off years. Clinton, who kind of famously hated the dinner, um, probably I wouldn't put up there as funny. Um, that's terribly funny. Bush 43 did well, but he typically did well um, with sort of these shticks or gags. I mean, there was that uh, famous one of him trying to find, he did a video where he was trying to find weapons of mass destruction in yeah. the White House. That was deemed offensive, but also, you know, rather humorous by some accounts. And then he had a, a Bush impersonator come up and sort of do a side by side. Yeah, I remember uh, that. Yeah, so, so, so he did okay, but I think, you know, left to his own devices, he's probably not the most talented comedian in the world. Clinton embarrassed me one year, although I enjoyed it. He said, I don't have to go through you anymore. I just go on Larry King. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> a couple of political questions. Uh, yeah. Anybody going to challenge Hillary in the primary? You know, Martin O'Malley's not, Martin O'Malley's not backing down, that's for sure. Um, I, I have to think that he probably will at least keep that murmur going. Um, but I think, as you know, at this point, um, Hillary Clinton's road to the nomination seems pretty clear. Who do you see on the Republican side? Anyone going to emerge? You know, I, I think right now the, the big folks, I mean, um, would be Jeb Bush uh, and Rand Paul, two very, very different candidates, two candidates who present very different challenges to uh, Hillary Clinton should she get the nomination. You know, with Jeb Bush, um, you know, people I've talked to recently, they obviously say that his big, big advantage is simply Florida. And, you know, that's one state, but you look at the Electoral College and Republicans grabbing Florida in 2016 would be an enormous deal. Uh, Rand Paul has less of a uh, l less of a, a stamp on that state. Marco Rubio obviously has a, a bigger stamp, but you know if one of those Republicans can grab Florida, um, that would make a very very strong case against whoever the Democratic nominee is. Patrick, congratulations on a great idea born into a great documentary. See you again Thanks soon. Thanks a lot, Larry. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.